Hi, everyone. This is Anita Banerjee with the Forefront Organization, a statewide organization for grant makers and nonprofits. I will be giving a presentation on the census today on this Facebook page for the Stevenson Center on Democracy. I'll be back in a few minutes, so hold tight. Hi everyone again, it's Anita Banerjee with Forefront. I will be starting a presentation on the census in a few minutes here um, at the two o'clock mark. Uh, you will see the slides are up, but I'll be starting shortly at two. Thanks for joining. Hi everyone, it's Anita Banerjee with Forefront. Um, we are almost at the two o'clock mark and I will be starting shortly. I'll be giving a presentation on the census today via Facebook Live for the Stevenson Center on Democracy.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be starting shortly. This is Anita Banerjee with Forefront. I will be presenting on the Census 2020 this afternoon in just a few minutes, uh, going Facebook Live for the Stevenson Center on Democracy. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Anita Banerjee with Forefront. I will be giving a presentation on the census in just a minute. We are almost at the two o'clock mark. Oh, looks like we are. I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining me on Facebook Live. I'm with the Stevenson Center on Democracy this afternoon as a guest speaker from an organization called Forefront. Forefront is a statewide organization I'm going to go to my next slide here. And we are an organization that focuses on all things uh, social impact sector, meaning we bring grant makers and nonprofits together on social impact issues all across the state. The census falls in line with our democracy initiative. Uh, it's a three year program focused on civic engagement. As you can see at the table on the right, We've got a separate area on all things civic engagement, the traditional sense, voter registration, voter education, um, and really thinking about voter um, enhancement in the particular presidential elections, the general elections this fall. And then we've got a bucket of work that's on just the census. Reason being is that Illinois is one of three states with the most to lose without a fair and accurate count. So we organized early and we organized often so that we could prepare during what we are in now, which is the self-response period for the 2020 census. So taking a quick step back, before we, I jump into why the census is important, I want to thank you all again for taking time to join me this afternoon. Um, in ideal circumstances, it would have been a great afternoon to meet with all of you in person. And I want to take a, a moment to thank the Stevenson Center on Democracy for working with me to find an alternative so that we can ensure our Illinois residents are getting counted this spring. 
Certainly, COVID-19 is our first and foremost priority, and we need to ensure that everyone stays safe and healthy amidst these tumultuous times. But this is also an opportunity to dig into our civic engagement duties. Uh, the census occurs once every 10 years, the decennial census, and it is an opportunity to provide for a better tomorrow. And we can't do this if everyone is not counted. So as I mentioned before, Illinois is one of three states with the most to lose without an accurate count. Reason being is that we have had considerable outward migration in the last five to six years alone. And knowing that we've had a lot of migration, outward migration of our population, knowing we've had a state budget in crisis this past decade alone, that two-year budget impasse in, the, in 2015 to 2017 really stymied the nonprofit sector across our state. And many of those organizations were just starting to dig out from under. And now we are amidst this health pandemic. So you can imagine that this census count is even more important to ensure three main things. First and foremost, our congressional representation. So since 1950, Illinois has lost one congressional seat in every census cycle. So we used to have 24 members of Congress. We now have 18. And this is what our congressional map looks like today. Now, keeping with the trend of losing one seat in every census cycle, we are most likely going to lose one after this 2020 census. And where would that seat come from? Many are surmising that it will come from the central west part of our state. So this is the map where potentially, if we lose one seat, what this uh, congressional map could look like. Now, understanding that we've had a lot of challenges this decade, if we don't make an effort to have a fair and accurate count, if we don't make an effort for residents to get counted, then we could very feasibly lose a second congressional seat. And where would that seat come from? Very likely the greater Chicago area. So this is what the map could look like if we lost two congressional seats. Now, this is really important because when we think about raising our voices with our congressional leadership, when we think about fighting for causes at the national level that are near and dear to us, we need to count on our congressional representatives to help our causes go forth. There is a really great body of research that shows us where pockets of hard to count population reside in any given congressional district, state elected official district, or even county elected official district. For those of you that like to, would like to dig in deeper, the uh, hard to count mapping tool out of the City University of New York was created ahead of the 2010 census and provided as a great resource to show us where many of these historically undercounted populations reside. It's a super easy tool. And at this point in time, while we're amidst the self response period, you can actually even go in in real time and see how folks all across the country or all across our state are responding to the 2020 census. Now, the second reason why the census is so important is that it impacts the federal dollars that come in to a state for the next decade ahead for the various social service programs. Now, another great resource, national resource, out of George Washington University is called Counting for Dollars. This body of work helps us to distill down that what that information, what that um, looks like, right? Um, the, the federal dollars that we get based off of our census count for the next decade ahead. So based off of our 2010 numbers, we were able to uh, look at this body of research and see that roughly $35 billion 
comes to Illinois annually for 55 social programs. Now, as I mentioned, this looks different from state to state, but for Illinois, that means $350 billion comes, has come to our state for this decade alone for social service programs that all residents across the state utilize in some way, shape or form. Now, even if you yourself aren't utilizing a social service program, we certainly know an extended family member, a grandparent, a neighbor, a community member, a colleague of ours at work that may rely on these services. So when we think about a fair and accurate count, we need to ensure that everyone is getting counted so we can rely on these necessary dollars for the next decade ahead. So what does this look like per person, right? We're talking about billions of dollars. Well, when you break that down even further, on average across the country, this looks like about $1,800 a person for just one year. So across the country, that means $18,000 is lost over the course of a decade when just one person is not counted. Now that number in Illinois is smaller, right? As I mentioned, we've had outward migration in the last five or six years alone. So that number comes out to about $1,400 a person for one year. But that's still $14,000 over the course of a decade that is lost in Illinois when just one person is not counted. And we, when we think about the children, zero to five population, or the children that are in kindergarten through 12th grade that rely on necessary federal resources, we need to ensure that that money is coming to our state for our future. Now this number is much higher in Minnesota. So Minnesota has uh, across the decades always had a very strong census count and their average per person right now is $2,800 for one person for one year alone. That's double the Illinois average. So now the third reason why the census is so important, and this is the one that I would say we don't always focus on, is that it helps us to plan for a better tomorrow. It helps us to designate what money is coming into townships and villages and cities. It helps businesses to determine where they're going to invest, where they should take chances on new growth. All of this is predicated on accurate data. So how does an undercount happen? Well, in every given census cycle, we have populations that are historically undercounted. And when we think about these populations, we often think about our communities of color, we think about our low income communities, and we think about our immigrant communities, right? In particular, our mixed status families, our undocumented individuals, but I'm here to tell you that historically undercounted populations are so, so much more. They are also the homeless, the disabled, the renters, the seniors, and the largest and hardest to count population are children under five. The undercounted number of children of this age range in 2010 was enormous. There is a great study from the Annie E. Casey Foundation that showed that over a million children of this age range went unaccounted for in the 2010 census all across the country. In Illinois, that was close to 100,000 children that went unaccounted for in the 2010 census. So when you think about this decade alone, we've got children that are 10 to 15 years old that went unaccounted for, that needed those necessary dollars while they're in school. So as we think about the 2020 census, we also need to think about the renters. There are so many students that go to school away from home and are living nine months of the year in a college town. If they are in a college town for a four-year university, they need to be counted in their college town. Yes, 
even the COVID-19 crisis, even amidst it, we need to ensure that many of our college students that are now home with their families still need to get counted in their college towns. Now that is a hard to count population because when you think about the resources that go in and out of a college town over the course of a decade, um, they really need to rely on those dollars while serving the student population. Now, the other population I want to mention are rural communities. We know that in Illinois, there are so many people that live in central and southern Illinois. Yes, we have a greater concentration in the greater Chicago area, but we've got folks that are of these various communities that are living in rural Illinois. And there isn't necessarily ready access to technology or to broadband. And with the census going online for the first time, with the Census Bureau wanting to get the majority of responses online, we need to ask our rural communities to think about uh, working right with their technology to get counted. But there are still two other ways that folks can respond. They can respond via the telephone and there are up to 12 languages that are provided for, um, or they can wait for the paper copy, the tried and true paper copy that is going to be mailed out this coming week between April 8th and April 16th. So when you think about our rural communities, they may just want to go ahead and fill out the paper copy. So amidst the uh, 2020 census going live uh, and this COVID-19 crisis, we need to ensure that communities are get, getting counted. But with every census cycle, there are a number of challenges. And 2020 census is, is not immune to that. We've had our fair number of challenges. And as I mentioned earlier, with us going online for the first time, this poses more emphasis on that digital divide, right? We've got folks that don't have access, or even if they do, they don't necessarily trust government in the same way to share personal household information online. So we need to ensure that our residents understand that they can, if they would like, they can go to 2020census.gov and they can take a look at the survey since it's live now. And they can determine whether they'd like to go ahead and fill out the census now with just their address if they don't have their unique ID code or if they'd like to call in their response or wait for the paper copy. Now, another challenge is that in every given census cycle, they need the Census Bureau, which is housed at the Department of Commerce, needs to plan for this data collection endeavor, which is the largest in the country every 10 years. It takes a lot of preparation. And in this particular decade, the Census Bureau has had a number of budget shortfalls. And how can you make sure that there are cybersecurity um, uh, place uh, positions in place? How can we ensure that the testing has been completed? How can we ensure that hiring is completed when you don't necessarily have the federal resources, right? The dollars that are necessary for this preparation. Now, they're trying the best they can amidst all of these challenges, but for the foreseeable future, the field operation is stalled until at least April the 15th, if not longer, given the COVID-19 crisis. And then of course, there have been leadership changes. The director um, that was at the helm of the Bureau left in summer of 2017, and it wasn't until January of 2019 when a new director was, was put in place. And so um, you can imagine the work for the Bureau has really been cut out for this decade's count. And then I would be remiss if I didn't mention the citizenship question, right? The Census Bureau got uh, word from the Department of Justice in March of 2018 that this question was being posed uh, for the 2020 census. Now it's been decades since this question has been on the form and it was determined, I wanna say it was in the 19, 
uh, 50s, before the 1960s census, that this question was not necessary. Amidst the civil rights era, it was determined that that question would not be necessary for statistical purposes. So having said that, that question in today's day and age is not necessary for data collection purposes. And after a long and hard fight in June of 2019, the Supreme Court uh, made their decision that this question was not necessary. And the Census Bureau was able to go ahead and confirm that. So there are still communities out there today that think that question is on the form. But I'm here to say it's not, it won't be on the form, but if you would still like to look at the questionnaire before responding, you can do so and see that that question is in fact not on the form. Having said that, um, we know that this is a particular time where many communities may feel consternation about filling out the form. The Census Bureau is protected by Title 19, which is a clause that ensures confidentiality. So that means every Census Bureau taker has to take an oath that this information that is shared with the Bureau is a one-stop shop, that it can't be used for any other purposes than statistical purposes um, from this data collection, and that the information is safe and protected for 72 years. So understanding the challenges and the various hard to count populations, how do we still do this work? How do we get an accurate count? Well, we need to rely on our trusted messengers with effective messages. The Illinois Count Me in 2020 program began in January of 2018, and it was forefront really bringing our social impact sector together, working with our grant makers and our nonprofits to build um, in partnership a strong program that would ensure coordination. So we pulled together a funders collaborative and a statewide advocacy coalition. And we got much of our uh, strength and our resources from our national partner, the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. They have a program dedicated to census outreach, the Census Counts campaign uh, called State Counts. They've got, I wanna say more than 40 states engaged in this effort. And they've got a website that is rich and chock full of information, more information than you would ever want on the census. So I, take, I urge you to take a look at the website, censuscounts.org. What Forefront has done is taking this information and making it more Illinois centric, taking the best golden nuggets from the national resources and sharing that on a website that we created, ilcountmein2020.org. I would highly encourage you to check it out. We've got more information on there that you would want, but great information that's specific to Illinois, that if you're interested in doing outreach during the self-response period, that you can take and plug, drop in your logos. We've got a great um, communications toolkit. We've got two iterations of it. We've got um, tons of social media memes and graphics and talking points that you can take and run with. But I would be remiss if I didn't mention that this work wouldn't have been possible without the initial seed money that was provided by our funders collaborative. So the Field Foundation and the Polk Brothers Foundation really helped lead the charge where Forefront was able to pool together $1.75 million for this statewide effort, which then allowed for 42 organizations across the state to get engaged in our Illinois Count Me in 2020 program. And they hit the ground running in spring of 2019 and have now been working long and hard to ensure that communities across the state are getting counted. Now, understanding that Illinois is one of three states with the most to lose, we've also had to ask government to step up knowing that we can't rely on philanthropy alone. So for the first time 
in census history in Illinois, uh, we had some state legislators that pulled together a statewide commission. This is being facilitated by the Secretary of State's office. There are 22 members on this commission from across the state, and we were one of the first states in the country to create this commission. It was created legislatively, and it was um, in March of 2018 that the commission went live. Great website here for you all to check out, IllinoisCensus2020.com. Now, we know that this work wouldn't have been possible without Governor Pritzker, Governor Rauner, and the General Illinois General Assembly stepping in and providing necessary dollars. The Illinois Count Me In 2020 Coalition, um, in partnership with the Rainbow Push Census Coalition, worked long and hard last legislative cycle to ask the new governor to put in more money than ever before for a fair and accurate count. There was this great body of research that came out of New York um, philanthropy that essentially said every state should be asking for $2 per population for that state for census outreach efforts. Now I'm generalizing this study, but that meant that we had to think about upwards of $25 million for this outreach effort. And I will tell you that Governor Rauner and his Illinois General Assembly in 2018 went ahead and appropriated $1.5 million, which opened the door for us to really consider um, a strong advocacy measure for more dollars coming to Illinois for the census effort. And in the start of 2019, we were not even sure we would get $12 million. But with uh, concerted efforts, from the Illinois Count Me In Coalition, the Rainbow Push Census Coalition, and our state budgeteers. While we didn't get $25 million, we got $29. $29 million, one of the highest per capita investments in the country, was appropriated and went to the Illinois Department of Human Services to create the Illinois Census Office. So we have today two state co-coordinators, and we've got 19 statewide regional intermediaries. So essentially state grantees that are invested in this effort. Highly encourage you to go to census.illinois.gov to check out more information about the state census program. Now, this has been enormous to have government step up with philanthropy in Illinois, but that doesn't stop there alone. We also have Cook County, the city of Chicago, and various local governments invested in this effort. So while the state of Illinois was making and leading this on this issue across the country, Cook County decided to put in $4 million for this statewide effort, and the city of Chicago, under the leadership of Mayor Lightfoot, has put in $2.7 million for census outreach efforts. Interesting fact, in 2010, Chicago had a 66% self-response. That number was exceedingly low um, across urban areas in 2010. So understanding that we had 66% of households responding in, in Chicago and knowing that our state could really miss out from a fair and accurate count, the mayor would really like for our efforts to extend so that we can get to that 75% mark in the 2020 census. We have a lot of work ahead of us and the COVID-19 crisis is making this work infinitely harder. So amidst this, the national advocate community and the Illinois um, advocates and stakeholders are, are, are trying to bring it. They're trying to work amidst this pandemic to ensure that communities are getting counted. And it's working, but we are going to need the strength of every household to self-respond from the comforts of their own home this spring. Public health and safety are absolutely critical at this moment, but planning for our future, 
incentivizing for people to stay in Illinois once we dig out from this crisis is, Im is imperative for us to have that better tomorrow. So as I mentioned, the census can, you can self-respond to the census in three ways, right? Online, via telephone, and by the paper copy. All that can be done from home without having to be in touch with the census taker. Uh, this link, my2020census.gov, um, can show you the census survey that is now live. The Census Bureau rollout is certainly um, changing, but this is the operational timeline that was designated for this year. So January to March was the awareness campaign, and many of you may have seen television ads highlighting the importance of getting counted. There are a number of them that have been rolled out um, in the last two weeks alone. While we're still amidst the awareness and motivation phase, uh, we are encouraging people to go to 2020, 2020 census.gov. And we're also encouraging folks to reach out to their families, their neighbors, their communities to ensure that folks are getting counted. Now, what is called the non-response follow-up period or the reminder phase was supposed to start on May the 12th. That has now been pushed to May the 28th, but understanding that we may be staying at home longer than anticipated, this reminder phase might be pushed back, which means that we have a longer period to ask our communities to get counted before census takers start coming to our door. And then there will be the official wrap up towards the end of the year, which will extend into August, since the Census Bureau is now allowing for folks to self-respond through August 14th. This has been extended by two weeks, and there is a potential for the count to actually be extended a little longer. But we're waiting on this information that will take congressional changes that just haven't come to fruition yet. But for all intents and purposes, we have from now through August 14th to get counted. But if you don't want a census taker coming to your door, then highly encourage you to get counted now before May the 28th. A couple, I think I made a couple of these remarks already, right? That we should look out for May the 28th, which is when the non-response follow-up period begins. The other point I wanted to make is that there are communities that are counted a little bit differently. So anyone living in a group home or a nursing home or a senior's home or in the prisons um, or the homeless, right? Shelters, homeless shelters. All of that is counted through what is called group quarter operations. And that operation period was supposed to start in, um, was supposed to be end of March. So the service-based enumeration for the homeless population was supposed to be March 30th, 31st, and April 1st. And as you can imagine, amidst the COVID-19 crisis, we've had to move that. They're now supposed to start that effort at end of April, but understanding that the field operation has already been uh, delayed and is on suspension right now, that also looks to change. But also wanted to bring to your attention again, the reminder that college students that uh, were not living in dorms. So dorms are considered part of the group quarters counting. But college students that were living in Greek houses or uh, apartments with friends or family, they still need to be counted in their college towns. And they can do this by going online to 2020census.gov and verifying their college town address when they self-respond. Now, another piece to this work was that in 2010, we had a quality assistance center program or questionnaire assistance center program, I should say, um, that that helped you troubleshoot the various nuances and questions that arose during self-response. That program was supposed to look a little different for 2020 and was to be called the Mobile Questionnaire Assistance Program. That program still looks to kick off this spring, but has been delayed due to the field operation suspension. 
So I know that this is a lot of information um, and a lot of slides and resources. So I will make sure to share this presentation with the Stevenson Center so that they can send it out and share it on the Facebook page and share it through their email listserv. But wanted to really quickly bring your attention to some census hotlines. These national hotlines provide an added security. It's an added protection for those communities that may feel consternation in filling out the census. Or if you feel that there's any kind of misinformation or disinformation that is out there and you'd like to share that, these resources are available to you 24 seven. Locally, as I mentioned, we've got the ilcountmein2020.org website. And this website is chock full of resources. Uh, we've got a census calendar, we've got the toolkits I mentioned, various fact sheets, uh, statewide webinars that you can go back and listen to, um, a number of videos, which I'll talk about in a minute, but also a great web page dedicated to census resources as uh, we are impacted by COVID-19. Then we've got the toolkit that I mentioned earlier. This is being used by advocates all across the state, not just with the forefront grantees, but the state of Illinois grantees, the Cook County grantees, and the city of Chicago grantees. And this link here will take you to the video that we created earlier this year that is intended for to be used to help um, advertise and promote a fair and accurate census. And then we've got three more, three more um, videos that we are calling vignettes that were created and we launched via a thunderclap on social media earlier this week on April the 1st, which is designated National Census Day, we were able to share these videos across the state, which actually then propelled Illinois back into the top 10 states across the country that have the best self-response rates for 2020. So amidst this crisis, you can see that there are advocates that are still working long and hard to ensure that our communities are getting counted. Would really encourage you to go to these, um, these sites, check out these, these videos, um, and share them with your families and your friends. By now. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, this is my contact information. Um, if you have any questions for me, please feel free to reach out. I know, again, that this was a lot of information, but really wanted to share the depth and breadth of information available and explain why uh, this census count is so important and why, while we are home, Right? Well, we have a few minutes that we should make every effort that we can to get counted. Thank you so much. Thank you again to the Stephen Center, Stevenson Center on Democracy for having me. Um, and please uh, look for me on social media, um, on Twitter, on Facebook, or Instagram. Thank you so much. Let's, let's plan for that better tomorrow. Let's ensure that our communities are getting counted.